Today's topic is Vesper or valence shell electron pair repulsion theory. A mouthful, but Vesper gives us insight into molecular geometry that arises from electron pair repulsion. This is a fancy way of saying that for any given molecular structure, electron pairs tend to assume the geometry that will place those electron pairs as far apart from one another in space as possible. The first thing we're going to look at here in terms of deciphering all the different possibilities are situations where we have a central atom bonded to other atoms without the presence of any lone pairs. This simplifies our life a little bit because it means that electron pair geometry is always going to be identical to molecular geometry. So we can go through these cases one by one, looking at situations. Do we have three atoms, four atoms, five atoms, six atoms bonded to our central atom? Let's kick off, actually, if we have two atoms bonded to our central atom. This would be something like BeCl2. For simplicity, I am not going to write electron pairs around the chlorine because they don't matter. It's only BE that we're looking at. Now, in order for the bonding electrons on beryllium to be as far apart from one another as possible, this molecule is going to assume a linear conformation. Next up, we have a central atom with three atoms bonded to it something like BF3. Again, I'm going to omit lone pairs around fluorine for simplicity because we are looking at boron. Boron is going to have trigonal planar geometry. Notice that each of these bond angles is 120 degrees. And actually, if we refer back to beryllium, BeCl2, Notice the bond angle is 180 degrees. Okay, let's keep going. We have four things around our central atom, something like CH4 or methane. We're going to now move into three dimensions with something called tetrahedral geometry. So as opposed to what I'm drawing here, you should really focus on what the tetrahedron looks like because that shows you how it's in three dimensions and is called tetrahedral. The bond angles here are now 109.5 degrees. And again, this is what allows these bonding pairs of electrons to be as far apart from one another in space as possible. Okay, so we have two more to go. Five means we have something like PCL5, five chlorine atoms bonded to our central phosphorus. This geometry is going to be trigonal bipyramidal. Notice how it's like two triangles affixed to one another. And then finally, if we have six atoms bonded to our central atom, something like SF6, we are going to have something called octahedral geometry. Okay, didn't draw that very well because these, uh, each of these bond angles, notice, is going to be 90 degrees. No matter which bond angle we're looking at in this octahedral geometry, all bond angles are going to be 90 degrees. Going back to PCL5, notice we have a combination in trigonal bipyramidal. We have a combination of 90 degree angles and 120 degree angles. So for these structures that uh, don't have any lone pairs, ranging from two to five 
atoms surrounding the central atom, you must know by heart all these geometries, linear, trigonal planar, tetrahedral, trigonal bipyramidal, and octahedral, along with their associated geometries. This is fair game for an exam. Now, what if we don't just have atoms bonded to our central atom, but we also have lone pairs? Well, some interesting things are going to happen here. The first thing to take note of is what we call electron pair geometry is now going to be different from what we call molecular geometry. So I'll go through some instances of that and I think it will become clear. So let's imagine, for example, that we have a molecule like SO2. Now it just so happens that SO2 has a double bond. But one of the rules of doing VSEPR, I'm trying to get a straight line here and not really succeeding. One of the rules of doing VSEPR is that we actually count a double bond as a single bond. So keep that in mind. And this means in terms of this molecule here, if we were to draw the Lewis structure, we'd have uh, a double bond from sulfur to one oxygen, a single bond to the other oxygen, and we'd also have a lone pair on our sulfur. This means that the electron pair geometry, because there are three things in total around this molecule, is trigonal planar. However, if we just focus on the molecular geometry, we have something that is called bent. Notice the bent geometry when we look at only the atoms, not the lone pair. Okay, so we see a distinction now. The next possible scenario would be to have a molecule such as NH3. If we were to draw the Lewis structure for NH3, we'd see that there are three atoms, three hydrogens, singly bonded to our nitrogen, but that nitrogen is also carrying a lone pair. This means that the electron pair geometry of NH3 is tetrahedral because there are four things around our atom in combination, bonding pairs and lone pairs. But if we focus just on the molecular geometry, we have something called trigonal pyramidal. And hopefully you can see that in this molecule. Just the atoms at play have trigonal pyramidal geometry. This trigonal pyramidal geometry does arise from the fact that it's tetrahedral with respect to its electron pair geometry. Next up, let's say we have water. Four things around our molecule total if we sum the electron pairs that are lone pairs and the electron pairs that are bonding pairs, one, two, three, four. Again, we get tetrahedral geometry. However, if we just look at the oxygens bonded to the central, I mean the hydrogens bonded to the central oxygen, we again get bent geometry. One more to go here for this slide. Let's imagine we have something like SF4. Again, if we drew the Lewis structure, we'd find that we have four fluorines singly bonded to sulfur, but that sulfur is already carrying a lone pair. This means there are five things around this molecule in combination, and we have trigonal bipyramidal geometry. This leads us to a rather odd molecular geometry structure going to get something called a distorted tetrahedron. So that's a little unusual, but there it is. We should be aware of it. Now, in terms of what I want you to know uh, for, again, for the exam, you should be able to do the electron pair geometry for any of these, but I'm really only going to ask you 
in terms of this electron pair geometry to be able to recognize bent, trigonal, pyramidal, and bent under the second scenario. So in other words, bent can arise in SO2, it can arise in H2O. You do not have to worry about knowing the distorted tetrahedron. Okay, we have some more examples to go through. So if we have five things around our molecule in a combination of lone pairs and bonding pairs, something like ClF3, we will have trigonal bipyramidal geometry. This will be, in terms of its molecular geometry, T-shaped. See the T here? Okay. Again, if we have trigonal bipyramidal, but this time our combination is two atoms bonded and three lone pairs, we're going to have, again, trigonal bipyramidal, five things around our central atom, but interestingly, this turns out to be linear, and an example of this is I3 minus. Okay, we have a few more to conquer here. Let's say we have six things around our molecule, BrF5, combination here is five atoms bonded and one lone pair, total of six, we get octahedral geometry. This turns out in terms of its geometry to be something we call square pyramidal. You can see a square here with a pyramidal top extending to these different atoms. Okay, one more to go. Let's say we have a combination of four atoms bonded to our central atom and then two lone pairs. That's a total of six. Again, we get octahedral and our final geometry, molecular geometry for our molecule is something called square planar. Good news, again, I'm not going to ask you to memorize all these molecular geometries that arise from a combination of lone pairs and bonding pairs. Just memorize what I have told you to memorize thus far. So now we want to know, how do we put the rubber to the road and actually do this? Well. The first thing we have to do if we're going to predict geometry using the uh, principles of Vesper is we need to draw the Lewis structure. So you have to draw a correct Lewis structure with a decided focus on what's going on with the central atom or the atom of interest. Once we have our atom of interest, we can evaluate the number of bonds and lone pairs around our atom of interest. It might be all bonds, in which case our life is pretty easy. It might be a combination of bonds and lone pairs. We will then be able to determine the electron pair geometry and the molecular geometry of the molecule at hand. I remind you that electron pair geometry and molecular geometry are the same if we do not have any lone pairs present in our structure and then electron pair and molecular geometries will be different if we have a combination of lone pair and bonding electrons. So let's just look at a simple example. Uh, we might be tempted, if we just drew a Lewis structure of water, we would very easily be tempted to think that this molecule has linear geometry. But since we know in the case of water, it has two lone pairs and then two bonds. It should be pretty easy for us to recognize at this point that this is tetrahedral geometry. And then if we think about the tetrahedron and what happens if these two lone pairs are occupying two corners of our tetrahedron, that the remaining molecular geometry must be bent. So this is the kind of strategic thinking that you have to employ to get with, to the right place. 
That's it for Vesper. Go forth, practice some problems, and prosper.